As children, we had fun playing on the merry-go-round, but one day, as adults, we will live in one. So today's topic is the O'Neill Cylinder, a giant rotating space habitat that's more akin to a small nation than a space station. For many of our regular viewers, this is a familiar concept, though we'll be exploring it in a lot more detail today. But first, let's start by repeating the basics of what one is and why they are an attractive option for the future homes of humanity. At a fundamental level, you can terraform almost any barren rock in space to be decently livable, but it requires vastly more effort than we tend to portray in science fiction, and the odds of finding a planet regular humans and Earth-based life could just as comfortably live on without some form of terraforming are virtually nil. Indeed entirely nil, as those conditions would likely only exist if something already lived there, and as we've discussed before, Trying to colonize a planet that already has an ecosystem on it much beyond basic bacteria is not really a practical option even if you ignore some of the big ethical issues. We don't have any place in this solar system even vaguely meeting Earth-like criteria, and while some planet with a 23 hour day and 102% of Earth's gravity and just 10% higher pressure might sound ideal, I'm writing this on a Sunday after daylight savings happened and that missing hour is definitely irritating, so I'm not sure even a 23 hour day would be very desirable, especially on a daily basis. Of course the only planet even close to Earth's day length is Mars, where the day is half an hour longer, and I wouldn't mind an extra half hour of sleep a day, but not at the expense of trillions of man hours of time into giving the place an atmosphere to breathe or putting up with gravity 38% of Earth's 1G. To add to that, the Universe is not exactly swimming in rocky material, and while your house probably doesn't weigh too much more than a loaded cargo truck, it's sitting on millions of tons of rock directly below you, while even a very avid gardener really only uses maybe the first meter of dirt below them. All that rock is really doing is providing gravity, and we have a cheat for that, we can spin things around and fake it for all practical purposes. This is the basic notion of a rotating habitat, and we did an episode on those way back in the first year of the channel and have talked about them many times since. The basic idea is easy, you build a big ring or cylinder and dump some dirt, water, and air inside, provide light and grow plants and build houses inside. It spins around and people are held in place by centrifugal force, technically a fictitious or pseudo-force, but then so is gravity under general relativity anyway, and fictitious or not, it will hold your feet to the ground just fine. If you spun the ISS around, the astronauts would be pinned to the sides by that same centrifugal force, and you could spin it faster or slower to provide more force. That would be very nauseating though, from the rate of spin required to provide gravity with its small diameter. But if you continue to build bigger, that rate of spin begins to decrease and eventually it rotates so slowly nobody would be able to tell that the gravity was artificial. The problem is that the bigger you make one, the stronger it needs to be to simulate a given amount of gravity, and the strength of the hull is identical to that of a suspension bridge under the same gravity with a length equal to the circumference of that hull. This led to the inevitable question of how big you could build one from modern materials with enough safety leeway for a decent amount of mass inside and for some damage to be possible without ripping the place apart. And in 1976, in the peak of post-Apollo enthusiasm, we got the answer from physicist Gerard K. O'Neill in his book The High Frontier, Human Colonies in Space, in which he proposed various cylindrical habitats including one 5 miles in diameter and 20 miles long, 8 kilometers by 32 kilometers for metric, at the effective safe limit for steel. You can actually push that out a good deal further even with steel and do decently better with aluminum or titanium, and much better with substances like Kevlar or Xylon, let alone graphene, but such a structure is well inside our production capability, ignoring its sheer hugeness and became the standard for discussing large cylindrical habitats 
and got named the O'Neill Cylinder. The specific maximum dimensions of such a structure, based on its material, isn't really the critical part, but the default large O'Neill Cylinder has 314 square miles or 804 square kilometers of internal area, which isn't huge compared to most countries, but it is on a size with a lot of smaller territories or subdivisions like a county. My own home county of Ashtabula, here in Ohio, is the largest in the state and only about twice that area and supports 100,000 people at a density of 56 per square kilometer, about double or triple the density we tend to think of for pre-industrial civilizations. My county is considered quite rural, amusingly bordering the smallest county in our state which packs in two and a half times as many people and in spite of mostly being forested, it is still a net exporter of food, so it's quite self-sufficient. And indeed, there are an awful lot of historical kingdoms and city-states that were no bigger. Moreover, O'Neill's design calls for two of these to be coupled together with some additional facilities attached or nearby, and there's nothing limiting you to adding more to a connected grouping you could walk or maybe float between. This is the key aspect, because you can certainly build them larger or smaller, but that size is big enough you are no longer picturing a space station that serves as a junction port for people and goods moving around, but an actual civilization that doesn't need to import or export a lot proportionally. At some point someone ran the numbers on mass and came in around 4-6 to thousand megatons for the Model 4 version, and if we assume that was mostly dirt, steel, and water, That means that the number of cylinders with a mass equal to our own planet would total over one quadrillion, or over a million billion, each having an internal area equal to a bit over a millionth of Earth's. So if someone made a planet's mass worth of those, you would have a couple billion planets worth of living space. This happens to be about identical to the amount of sunlight the Sun cranks out relative to what hits Earth, a couple billion times more, And another notion that was gaining popularity at the same time was the Kardashev Scale and the Dyson Sphere or Swarm. So if you found an Earth-mass planet, you could terraform it and now have a whole extra planet to live on, or you could turn it all into O'Neill cylinders in a swarm around a star and have a billion extra planets worth of living area. And unlike terraforming a planet, which does require about as much work per bit of new living area as just building it from scratch, When you're done, you have a structure with identical conditions to that of Earth, since you can dial its gravity up to whatever you want, and light the thing on whatever schedule or temperature you want. You don't have to mimic Earth's conditions, but you have that option. Again, for channel regulars, this is kind of old hat, but for those who aren't, it's a big reason why I spend so much time mentioning rotating habitats like the O'Neill Cylinders and Dyson Swarms, big clouds of these things around a star. These are even more attractive to us on this channel as we tend to assume some technologies being developed that make them even better. For instance, the classic O'Neill cylinder calls for either windows in the sides to let sunlight in, or an elaborate mirror system to bounce it in. We tend to assume we'll eventually master fusion and just internally power and light it. That's not necessary, but would certainly be handy. You can do the same with a big grid of solar panels outside and some LED lights inside, but those weren't very good options in O'Neill's day, again the book is from 1976 and he died of leukemia in 1992, before we had relatively cheap and efficient solar panels and LED lighting. Indeed the latter were still pretty impractical and uneconomic even a decade ago, whereas now fluorescence and incandescence are mostly being retired in favor of LED lighting which is pretty much better in every regard. We've also seen aerogel become more viable for mass production, an ultralight but sturdy substance that helps a lot for making your interiors of such a habitat a little less 2D. The normal way to add depth to a rotating habitat is to pimple and dimple the shell so you don't need as much dirt inside, a hill is just a big pimple of steel with a thin layer of soil over top, and a deep lake or dimple down off the hull. This is not really ideal from an engineering perspective, or for reconfiguring your landscape, so being able to make a mound of aerogel covered with dirt is preferable. We've also created stronger materials, and odds are that graphene, which is simply carbon and very abundant in the universe, could be mass manufactured inside a decade or two. This allows much bigger habitats, 
but more importantly perhaps, allows much thinner hulls on them that are also much stronger than a steel one. Lastly, we've come a long way with automation since O'Neill's day, so the notion of building one of these things seems less daunting. Robots able to mine and refine the raw materials from the moon or some asteroid and do all the assembly and welding don't seem like wild science fiction anymore, even if we're not quite there yet. And as we saw earlier this spring in our Spaceports episode featuring the Gateway Foundation's huge spaceport, that basic assembly technology now exists, even if the spaceport we saw there, while dwarfing the International Space Station, would fit inside an O'Neill cylinder like a bike wheel inside your garage. All of these concepts make the O'Neill Cylinder and its various cousins much more attractive and plausible as a pathway to space colonization for humanity. You don't colonize other planets, you build them, tailored in size and environment to what you want or need, and discussing a future from that perspective rather than terraforming planets has been a big focus of this channel since its inception. So that covers all the basic review of concept, but folks will tend to ask what life inside one of these things is actually like. What's the weather like? What's the sky like? The landscape? What happens if you get struck by some meteorite or weapon? Would you realistically ever even build one, and when and where would we do our first ones? We'll answer that last first, and generally the place proposed for building the first one is at the L5 point of the Earth-Moon system. Indeed the L5 Society was founded in 1975 based largely around O'Neill's idea even though the book that popularized it wasn't out for another year. Its founder, Keith Henson, happens to be a personal hero and inspiration of mine along with O'Neill, and I got to talk to Keith several times this last year along with getting introduced to a lot of other folks from the L5 successor organization, the National Space Society and obviously that was a great pleasure and honor to get to correspond with those folks and pick their brains. The reason for the name is that in any two-body system you get five Lagrange points, a place of modestly stable and stationary orbits that don't seem to move relative to the two bodies in question. For instance the L4 and L5 spots for the Earth and Moon are out at the same distance from the Earth the Moon is, and remain 60 degrees ahead or behind the Moon on its orbit. Indeed they each form an equilateral triangle with the Earth and Moon and are very good places to set up ports to send material out deeper into space or receive incoming ships, and they need virtually no station keeping fuel, which is otherwise a pretty hefty requirement for any satellite or space station and more so for something as gigantic as a space habitat. You can put one lower and closer to Earth or the Moon but only if you've got means for station keeping and again that's no problem in a fusion economy but requires a lot more relative effort without that, so L4 and L5 tend to be considered the ideal first places. L1, L2, and L3 are still better than other spots but less stable than L4 and L5, and the two are identical in their advantages, to the best of my knowledge, so I'm not sure why it was L5 over L4, maybe they flipped a coin or light 5 better. There really isn't a specific size to these cylinders, O'Neill gave four example sizes with rounded numbers and the biggest, Type 4, is the one that usually gets mentioned. I generally use it for any cylinder or cylinder pair many kilometers in size but smaller than the giant graphene versions. These giants are the Bishop Ring and the McKendry Cylinder, which I usually just call Continent Class Habitats to save time, and since O'Neill's three reference designs are Islands 1, 2, and 3, and the graphene versions are too big to classify as an island unless maybe you're referring to Greenland. We see them in fiction a lot, though not so much in film or TV. If you're familiar with the Gundam franchise, an O'Neill Cylinder is pretty much the first thing we see on screen in the original animation and it's beautifully done. The eponymous space station from Babylon 5 is an O'Neill Cylinder, A spaceship version of one appears in Arthur C. Clarke's classic novel Rendezvous with Rama, and the Citadel from the Mass Effect franchise is basically one too. Okay, so why would you ever build one? That's tricky for the same reason lots of space concepts seem always delayed and 10 or 20 years off. There's a bit of a catch-22 with space that a lot of the cool things you can do up there require the other stuff be built first. 
but this one is big enough that I'll just flat out say, you don't build stuff like this, especially the full-blown multi-kilometer kind, until spaceflight is cheap enough that most people can afford a ticket. If you're living in a space habitat, you're living on alien soil because we wouldn't mine the materials for these from Earth. You wouldn't create one of these until you've got some serious infrastructure in space and automation good enough that it doesn't take a lot of human oversight to scoop up some iron or aluminum from the moon, refine and process it into structural bits, and weld it into place. The switchover to when they become a place many people live, or even most of them, would then just occur organically at whatever point building an acre of O'Neill cylinder is about the same price as buying one down on Earth. If Earth ends up going the Ecumenopolis or Matrioska shell ward path we've discussed before, that could easily result in land prices down on Earth running what they do in major metropolises, and folks wanting to live in one of these O'Neill cylinders so they could have some cheap land. Needless to say, for the near future, building one of these things would be much more expensive per square meter than even buying land in downtown New York City or Tokyo, but that would drop a lot as you not only get cheaper spaceflight but off-Earth sources of material. That would impact the four basic interior densities we tend to see though. The cheapest path is the densest path, where it's basically a city with some gardens and parks and likely many layers, either in the building or the actual cylinder itself. So long as you are wide enough that each layer is only a little higher or lower relative to the diameter of the station, you won't have much change in apparent gravity between levels. Lighting those levels only becomes an issue if you need to get rid of heat, and you can have a ton of radiating fins poking out of one though by preference these should be off the non-spinning axis, not sticking off the sides where they are under immense stress. Solar panels, incidentally, make handy radiators since they already have a large surface area relative to their mass. A couple of notes on building these. First, especially early on, you are going to place them where you want people and away from Earth. That's likely to be in asteroids with emphasis on in an asteroid not on an asteroid or next to one. Excavating an asteroid is very easy, they have virtually no gravity, so you just dig a hole a little bit bigger than the cylinder habitat, line it with something, and stick the cylinder in there to spin around. You don't have to excavate all the way in either, you can just land in a crater and excavate a little and dump the unused stuff around you as a protective shell, a blister sticking out from the asteroid rather than a crater, and that would probably be a common approach essentially expanding the asteroid as you hollowed it out. Incidentally, this is why we often see these things in pairs. It's much easier to give such habitats their spin, and maintain it, if you have something to push against, so a twin rotating in the opposite direction, or a big asteroid with thousands of times the net mass, is ideal. You can link more cylinders together over time as you hollow an asteroid out for its raw materials, and eventually even just construct a big spherical shell around the whole lot of them with a thin layer of rock on it. Actually, there's another reason we go with a pair of these and that is because of something called precession, which you would have encountered if you've ever looked at a spinning gyroscope. The gyroscope doesn't stay exactly still and instead traces out a circle, which is caused by the torque of the spin on it. Now in space, that precession movement is made worse and the entire habitat can suddenly flip over. Besides being extremely unpleasant, everything inside would be exposed to large forces that could rip the cylinder apart as everything changes direction. Fortunately, with two such habitats joined together, spinning in opposite directions, that torque and the resulting precession are largely eliminated. If we stick the habitat into that asteroid, you are effectively providing it with a very capable shield from radiation, micrometeors, and weaponry. For this reason, you'd not expect to ever see a naked O'Neill cylinder actually spinning in space as you approached it, though we always show them that way. It's just easier to build one with a big shell around it that is heavier and a storage facility for things you need but don't need gravity, and that superstructure would either not spin or do so in the opposite direction and slower. That spoils the visual effect though, so again we don't show them that way much nor probably with hundreds if not thousands of smaller ancillary facilities connected to that superstructure or hidden within it, some possibly with partial or full rotational gravity themselves. 
so we know what the outside looks like, but what about the inside? Classic image is a big flat cylinder with the horizon rising, but I suspect this is false too. That's not an ideal look, seeing a reverse horizon or your neighbor's yard hanging overhead, so I suspect they go a lot more 3D, lots of hills and valleys to disrupt that rising horizon along with the sun not rising or setting with it. So while the easiest landscape to do would be a flat one, I expect you'd see a lot more up and down, more Scottish Highlands than Kansas Plains, with lots of hills or trees to break up the horizon. Of course that depends on density, you could populate one of these as heavily as a metropolitan area, with many millions of folks and agriculture being done hydroponically in lower levels or attach smaller and cheaper stations nearby. Or you could go suburban, or rural, or even near deserted. We've talked about using these as wildlife reserves because they are closed environments but big enough to support a mostly self-sufficient ecosystem, certainly on any short timelines, and you could make them bigger or artificially introduce genetic diversity when it is needed, but short of very large creatures or apex predators, one is big enough for most species to exist without genetic bottlenecking. The big issue causing these to be different from Earth is the sky. Not the sun itself, whatever you use for that, be it a big mirror or a light bulb, makes no difference, people don't look at the sun and that's why folks are often a little surprised at its actual appearance when they see photos of it dimmed down, it's just a big whitish gold blob and that's very easy to fake nowadays with LED lighting or mirrors. However, unless you want a perpetually cloudy day, you need to take some special efforts if you want the classic blue sky or starry night. Those don't have to be terribly extreme or high tech, even just a big thin blue cylinder higher up that had some light on it at night arranged to mimic our own constellations would do the trick, and you just keep your ceiling decently higher than birds fly. You can also play with the atmosphere content to absorb green light or your sunlight to have more blue and less green, or tweak it for reds in the evenings, but that's the one area where you can't quite perfectly mimic Earth with a little artificial effort. Now nobody wants perpetual clouds, but we do want some and folks ask what the weather is like on these, and that's very hard to generalize because it depends a lot on the size of the station. One of the big factors in our own weather is the spin of the Earth and the Coriolis effect produced by that, and rotating habitats have that too, and would have inertial circles in the air and water like Earth does. Very generally, the bigger they are, the closer they will tend to match Earth. You definitely get weather, wind, rain, and waves on these, but it will be different in patterns than on Earth. For instance, in smaller ones, there's very little change in pressure with altitude, you are essentially a pressurized can rather than a place where a lot of air sits on more air being squeezed denser by it, so cloud effects are going to be different there, as the sky only goes so high and the closer you get to the middle, the lower the gravity is. It's actually hard to predict much on this because someone always notices another little detail that would be different. I remember a discussion of it on the channel's Reddit group last year where someone pointed out that a raindrop starting near the axis up high initially falls much slower than close to the ground, gravity is lower while air drag remains about the same as near the ground. Unlike on a planet, the atmosphere doesn't thin out as much in the volume of an O'Neill cylinder, though it does in really big versions like a Banks orbital or Ringworld, where more of your surface air pressure is the result of the atmosphere above you. In many versions you could also get a sideways looking vortex of clouds as stuff loops around the central low gravity axis, and one can imagine birds adapting to learn to fly in low or no gravity at the higher altitudes. I wouldn't be surprised if a lot of places opted to hang fake clouds spinning at the same rotational rates as the station and stuck lower gravity environments up there or skip the cloud look for flying islands or cities and you might get some very interesting three-dimensional ecologies that way. Again, you can make these very like Earth, but you don't have to, and since the sky is the hard part to mimic Earth with, I tend to expect that to be the one folks most casually take artistic license with. I'd be remiss if I didn't point out that these need not be cylinders either. You could cap the ends with cones or curves instead of a flat plate as a sort of fake mountain range with lower gravity, 
which is appealing as a place to visit if you want to climb mountains or go hang gliding through ravines with less risk and exhaustion. You can, of course, do a simple sphere, but then you have no gravity at the poles and the highest gravity at the equator. You'd also have issues with water collecting down, basically forming a big equatorial ocean band with desert or tundra up near the poles and nothing at all right on the poles with no gravity to stay down. That's okay if you are using those as your spaceport though. Many geometries are possible, but the cylinder is the most obvious and pragmatic one. You generally want them longer than they are wide too, so it's worth noting that you can treat them like rods and connect them to each other at the ends in a big wire frame to add more space without needing additional structural strength and in doing so create some truly enormous regions of living area. There is no real limitation on length, just width, and I often picture folks making these as big connected wireframe globes, possibly with concentric layers, out of some original small asteroid that's being eaten up to build a big exterior fake globe full of these and immersed inside a bigger reservoir of gas, be it fusion fuel or even air that you could fly around in without gravity. Friction isn't an issue as again you'd usually sheath such a cylinder with a second non-spinning protective layer and just have a vacuum between those two layers. There are tons of possibilities, and we've discussed many of them in other episodes, but this is the basic O'Neill Cylinder, arguably the first space-based megastructure you would build, and the one I tend to think a few hundred years from now are where most humans will live. They don't take much mass, so you can build trillions of them in a solar system, they are actually mobile, unlike a planet, so you can move one if you need to dodge an asteroid or leave an area that's become unfriendly or unwelcoming. They also have next to no real gravity, so getting materials into and out of them is really easy because there is no gravity well to contend with. They are also about the minimum size for a respectable sovereign entity. I'd imagine most would be the equivalent of maybe a county or a state inside a larger nation, but they are big enough to administrate themselves and have all the specialists they need and a population large enough that you can move around inside of one if you don't like your old neighborhood and encounter people you've never met, but also small enough for a genuine feeling of intimate community and for most business and civic roles to be filled with some variety. Depending on scale and density, you'd expect populations anywhere from 10,000 to 10 million, and again are easily directly linked together to allow groups of them to form integral wholes. One downside is they are not really ideal spaceships because they are fairly massive and not really designed with acceleration in mind, though they can be designed to be better at that, it's just hard to reconfigure one to that setup if you didn't start that way. Using one as the core of an interstellar space arc is a fairly common notion, we see it in Clark's Rendezvous with Rama and in the Expanse with the spaceship Naboo, or the male gourd fuels design from artist Rapid Thrash, but it's the difference between an airplane and a mobile home. Our O'Neill cylinder needs a bit of time to get going but can move itself to a new spot and indeed if it's fusion powered, a whole new solar system. That's one reason I stress them as big enough for a complete functioning civilization, because while I'd imagine you'd see a lot of them formed up in alliances of thousands or millions of them as a single nation, if the population doesn't like things, they can just move, and it's the sort of structure that you pretty much can only blow up, not conquer, because invading a can like that is basically a death trap. Not that they are fragile, as I mentioned in Interplanetary Warfare, they can be armored up quite nicely and wrapped in point defense systems and a whole cloud of smaller facilities doing manufacturing or agriculture and defense, and be just as sturdy as any planet, at least as far as the folks living on it are concerned. Remember, on a planet, you've got thousands of kilometers of protective rock, but it's all underneath you, only the atmosphere protects you from orbital bombardment. In a rotating habitat, all the rocks and metal are between you and any hostile invader. Such being the case, I tend to think they'd serve as the sort of bottom rung of any nation-states we see in space, because they don't really need anybody else. They'll doubtless be vulnerable to economic sanctions and blockades of trade, physical or digital, but that's about the limits of your diplomatic options short of kill everyone, so it's entirely a guess but I suspect most would be pretty touchy about maintaining most of their local authority and not centralizing it much 
more of a city-state or feudal setup than what we tend to see in nations after the Industrial Revolution got fully into swing. We could go the other way entirely of course, but there would still be a lot of trade. Interplanetary trade, as we discussed in that episode, is quite problematic for anything but data, but these aren't interplanetary, they are smaller and way more numerous. That means you are a lot closer to your neighbors and you also have no gravity well to fight. Indeed you could often make the trip to your nearest neighbor by just going out to the outer hull in a spacesuit and timing your release, then drift off at 200 meters per second for the next station that might be a thousand kilometers away, but you'd cover that in 5,000 seconds, or an hour and a half. Fire a few puffs of gas to correct your course and grab onto the side spinning at the same speed you were and climb on in. I could easily imagine that being a common sport. Even where the stations aren't physically connected by a pressurized connection or a long tether, you could build a spaceship able to reach that distance in your garage with some sheet metal, some fire extinguishers, and a blowtorch. Even more than moving around an asteroid belt, spaceships inside a system with lots of O'Neill cylinders hardly require crack teams of engineers and precise manufacturing. So between the relatively small population and the relatively small distances, I would expect a lot of specialized manufacturing and trade, and for that same reason, I would not expect to see these places opting for isolationism or total sovereignty much either but probably be more like an alliance of city-states or islands in an archipelago. You can probably see by now why I tend to always mention these things as ubiquitous in the future. They are a very attractive option if your civilization has decided to stay mostly human rather than pursuing various bioforming or cybernetic techniques, or has gone transhumanism or for a digital existence and of course assuming they've got the resources and automation to make these places cheap enough that regular folks could afford to buy a home on one. We'll be exploring more about the consequences and challenges facing post-scarcity civilizations more this spring, and we'll see that there actually are a lot of those even if as a whole life is much better than now, much as life is much better now than a couple centuries ago but not without its challenges, some the same as our ancestors faced, and many unique to us. Now, we were talking about the weather on these earlier, and I mentioned how minor changes to size, rotation rate, or geometry could seriously alter the dynamics of weather patterns in one. If you're curious to know more about how that functions, I'd recommend Brilliant's course Out in Nature, which will walk you through everything from seasonal impacts to the Coriolis effect. One of the things I like about Brilliant is that they've got a core set of 8 principles for learning that match up very well with my own philosophy on the matter and three of those are that it has to be exciting and cultivate curiosity and questions, but another is that it has to be active. This channel definitely goes for the long and in-depth side of the spectrum as science videos go, but even if the episodes were ten times as long, it can't replace that hands-on aspect of taking examples and actually working them out yourself that's necessary for true understanding and mastery of these concepts. So if you'd like to improve your understanding of math and science, and help support the channel while you're at it, go to brilliant.org slash IsaacArthur and sign up for free. And also, the first 200 people that go to that link will get 20% off the annual premium subscription. Next week we will return to the Fermi Paradox to discuss alien beacons, and ask just how far away you can say hello to civilizations if you want to, as well as what other reasons you might have to build such an enormous transmitter. The week after that we will take a look at the kind of civilizations that can afford to make things like giant beacons or telescopes as we start an expanded series on post-scarcity civilizations, and the week after that we will be exploring how far away you can see with a look at mega telescopes and just how big you can make a telescope. For alerts when those and other episodes come out, make sure to subscribe to the channel, and if you enjoyed this episode, hit the like button and share it with others. Until next time, thanks for watching and have a great week.